very, very, very well so that all the ladies are, can be good or... <laughs> oh, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I was. I, I can relate to David when he said that. That is a good sound to those that love the word of God. Now you have to know though that there are some assemblies that you're gladder to go to than others. And this is one of those real glad assemblies. I, for that cause, I, I rejoice for the opportunity to, um, to speak the things that, that have to do with my faith in God and yours too, because a good testimony isn't, it's personal, but it's not private. It's personal because it's ours, but it's shared by everyone really. And I'm glad for this assembly because we can speak openly the things that we have seen of God without any fear of casting our pearls, so to speak, that everyone here is going to be able to relate and love the things that God has done. Amen. Now, because this is a testimony, <clears throat> that's what I'm going to do. Back in the South, uh, there are some preachers that are wont to say, can I have a witness? Can somebody testify? And I can say, by the grace of God, yes, I can testify. Amen. I remember way back, this was, be I reckon time by the, um, the lack of, of any concept of school, that I must have been very young, well before school age, when I first started having some serious thoughts about God. I recall one time in the car, uh, an awful dread came over me, really. And I was so concerned. I couldn't wait until my mom stopped the car. I leaned forward and I said, Mom, do I love God enough? Well, she wasn't saved at the time. So she says, well, if you're worried about it, you probably do. And that comforted my childish heart. I thought, oh, good. I love God enough. And then I can recall also, we, we lived way out in the country. And every once in a while, I'd like to sit out and watch the sun set. Florida has beautiful sunsets. But as the clouds begin to get more red, the idea of the earth being burned in the judgment would creep into my thinking sometimes. And that scared me. It scared me big time. It was as though I were seeing the flames that were consuming the world coming across the fields toward me as the sun came down. And I just, it, I didn't know what to do except for just be afraid. And I realized that I was in the time of the new covenant. I, I realize now, but I was not in the benefit of the new covenant. I, the, the law, which is our schoolmaster, was beginning to teach my conscience the need of a savior. And it was impressed upon me. I, I was serious at a young age. Now, at the age of eight, I was baptized into Christ. But again, having, being in the new covenant has got very much to do with, with really entering in with all of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Now there's a time when, when we come in and, and we don't know a whole lot, but we do know that Jesus loved us and we do know that he died for us. But unfortunately, I was in an assembly where there wasn't a whole lot of truth. I mean, I read my Bible. I didn't understand quite as much of it as I would have liked to. But I wasn't grounded and rooted in the truth. And so it didn't take a long, to long time for me to kind of drift away. And I, I grieve to say that there was a time in my teen years when if I had died, I would have been ever the child of hell. Anyone was. But I want to talk about the glory of the new covenant. And it has to do with God's love for us. That love that as a child I knew was there didn't understand it, but I knew God. Somehow God was wonderful. And somehow God loved those of us that he created in his own image. Now I'd like to talk about what the, it's, it's the glory of the new covenant. The this is a glorious covenant. What makes it glorious? It's one thing to call something something, but like, so why is it? I'm going to tell you it's glory by its effect in me. And I, these are the things that I know that you'll relate to. Uh, one is 
the peace that I have that is born of enmity removed and of a trust in my God. Um, to be without peace with God is turmoil and vexation of soul. You can't run from it when you lay your head on your pillow at night. It's still there. But whenever you have peace with God, when you're no longer the enemy of God in your mind and in your heart, then the things of this world lose their power to disconcert you, to fret you, as it were. Now we get concerned about things from time to time. There may be sorrows that come upon us. That's the lot of mankind. But it's not the same order. It doesn't have the same power. Mm -hmm. And we have resources that, that people who don't know God can't even dream about. I have an awareness of God's presence. Again, that's one thing to say. But now you think about it. Think about your walk with God. The times when that precious awareness. Now we, we have it up here. But there's times, brethren, whenever you, you don't see him, but you know. You know God is with you. You think about him. You're fellowshipping with him in your thoughts. Mm -hmm. you're, you think things like, God would be pleased with that. Or... Well, I wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole. God wouldn't like that. And not because we're going, well, if I do that, I'm going to get punished. But it's more than that. It's you prize that fellowship, that awareness. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Mm -hmm. No. At what point your destination becomes different, so does your walk. You have to part ways there. Amen. You have to be going the same place to walk together in the same path. Amen. Now, um, also, you, it, it, I realized that there was a time that I was in the thinking of God before I was ever born. So were you. Anytime you, you hear me say me, you can substitute me for you too. And that is in John 17, verses 20 through 26. And I know this because it says right off, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That's me, brother. That's you. We believed on him through the word of those that were with him. Mm -hmm. That they, may, they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, mm -hmm. that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, and they, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved me, them as thou lovest me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Mm -hmm. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee. And these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Amen. That was the will of God concerning us, brethren. Amen. This is that presence of God that I'm talking about. Him in me, and I in him, the Father in him. That We're not talking about proximity. We're talking union. Amen. And then, <clears throat> now please don't, don't be alarmed. I, these are not all notes. It just, I have. <laughs> Those that have heard me go on for at least 15 minutes with not a scrap of paper in front of me may have been afraid at the sight of all this paper. Now, Brother Louie, Again, this is that uh, kindred of, of mind, but he, he went ahead and he read one of my scriptures for me, and that was that Hebrews 1 text about God who at sundry times and in divers manners and times past spoke to the fathers by the prophets, but now, now. See, if God wasn't going to speak to us in Christ Jesus, there'd have been no reason for him to speak to the prophets or to the fathers. Amen. But it was anticipation of the coming of Christ where God continually dealt with mankind until the fullness of time should come. 
and he should give us this great salvation that we testify of today, the, the glory of the new covenant, which he anticipated. Um, one of the, the other things that really the, the believer can rejoice in is the awareness that I can and I am pleasing to him. What a large thing this is. How much of the human race could never really truthfully say, I am pleasing to my God. It almost, it almost sounds arrogant, except for that the confidence which causes me to say that is not rooted in what I have done, but in the Christ who accomplished it on my behalf. Amen. And what he do, did was very good, and it was perfect. Perfect enough for God to accept and me to trust. Amen. And so just the knowledge to really know that you are living, that I am living in the acceptance of God, accepted in the beloved. This is a wonderful, wonderful, glorious thing that, the, yeah. that we have in the new covenant. Yeah. And then joy in God. Now I've heard people talk about joy. And to some of them, they don't have joy unless they got springs in their shoes, which is fine. That's fine if that's, if that's how joy works itself out in you. But even when your step isn't quite so springy, there is a joy welling up in our heart. Joy in God. Now, you can't joy in God unless you know him. You can't. Just like you can't believe what you don't know, you can't rejoice in what you don't have. You can't rejoice. I mean, if you all were saved and I was excluded from the covenant, there wouldn't be an ounce of joy in my soul. To look at every one of you would be nothing but vexation of spirit to me because I'd see what you had and I couldn't have it. Now, I might be able to muster up a little gladness for you, but I wouldn't have joy. I really wouldn't. I joy in my God who has said whosoever will may come and that he has made me willing in the day of his power. Amen. A, a strong desire to please him and holy aspiration. Now that's been touched on. I won't go into the, the, the strong desire to please him because Brother Given and Brother Louie have done a very good job of developing that aspect of this. But think about having holy aspirations. They, it, it's, it goes beyond just doing what you're told to do. Amen. It makes you aggressive in the kingdom. It employs the things that God has made you and given you in his service. Mm -hmm. It makes you, uh, it, it uses a certain amount of creativity, holy creativity. Yeah. How can I, I mean, you, instead of just saying now, all right, I've got to do this and I've got to do that. All right, I did that. Like checking it off a list. Okay, we got that done and this. Don't want to forget that. Instead, we're saying, Oh, no. that's the stuff you just you do now what can I do what would please God and it isn't a because I have to do some extra things you just that's the way you think mm -hmm. you anytime you love something nobody has to tell you now you think about that you don't and so this is that holy aspiration when you're sitting in the pew and someone is giving the word of God it inspires us. There's times when I sit in the pew and hardly can choke back tears and think, by the grace of God, that's what I want to be. That's what I want to do too. I want to be that. I want to do those things because I want to be closer to God than I am right now. And I haven't plumbed his depths. And then Brother Louis. I almost didn't have to come up here and talk, brother. <laughs> but I forced myself. <laughs> Anticipation of glory. Obtaining the inheritance. Now, we do have it in part. But that anticipation of glory. Now, you can't make yourself do that. Just kind of like you can't make yourself do a lot of other things. You have to see something a little bit before you can look forward to it. And that's one of the things Christ has brought us. 
is that anticipation. Wisdom from above, not carnal, sensual, rooted in ourselves, but wisdom from above. See, God, again, is taking his wisdom and he, he's entrusting his very character and nature to us. Amen. He, he is cultivating us in the kingdom, bringing us to our very highest and even beyond what we thought that was. Amen. Everybody, everybody. I can remember a time whenever uh, I thought, well, let's see, there's preachers. Who serves God? There's preachers and there's preachers. What do you do if you want to serve God and you're not a preacher? But no, no you think I'm joking. Uh, I won't tell you what camp I come out of, <laughs> but that's pretty much it. I mean, and I shared this with my Sunday school class one time. I thought and this was, this was younger on, that the very best thing to be would be a Jew because they were God's people. I hadn't understood about Christ taking down that wall of partition between the Jew and Gentile yet. So the very best thing to do would be a Jew. And the very best kind of Jew to be would be a male Jew because they were the ones that got to go in and do the temple worship and be before the presence of, the God, of God and everything. And then if you really, really got wild, and you want it to be the highest of the best. You want it to be a son of Levi. Of, and you want it to be a son of Aaron. And you want it to be able to be a high priest to come into the presence of God. Oh. But here I was. I was not only not a Jew. I wasn't a male. And I had no connection at all with Levi apart from reading about him in the scripture. And I thought, I'm undone. I'm undone. How am I going to serve God? And I comforted myself. I said, well, at least I'm still human. I could have been born a cockroach or something. And, <laughs> and, you know, and I, you think I'm joking. I'm not making a joke. I mean, that was a real thought I had. And so I just rejoiced at that part, that point that I was human and that I could, you know, at least slide in with salvation. Somehow or another, I was going to get into heaven. The glory of the new covenant burst upon my understanding. And it unshackled me from those small thoughts about myself and God. Amen. Now, that's why it's such a glorious thing to me to realize that I'm accepted. Why I don't, I mean, now I love good preaching. You must understand that. And I agree wholeheartedly about preaching being the highest form of communication. I'm a product of good preaching. But... I realize that everything we do in Christ Jesus, this is the glory of that better covenant. Everything that we are, everything that we do, comes under this heading of serving God. We do it as unto the Lord, heartily with all our might. Amen. Life and death make sense. You ever thought about that? Amen. How many people do you talk to? They don't know what life's about. They really don't. Look at the way they live. They don't know what life is about. They don't know why they're here. They think some amoeba was their dad. They, you know, you go far enough back in the family tree. But they don't know why they're here. There's no meaning to their existence. Just get what you can while you're here and eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. They don't know what death is about. They don't know why people die. They don't know why things happen. Now, I'm not saying we have particular knowledge about why a particular person goes at a particular time. But we understand the principles of life and death. Amen. And we see that there is a cause for life. Mm -hmm. And we see that even in death, there is victory. Amen. And we don't have to fear it anymore. Amen. And that that death, if, if we die in the Lord, is actually what was intended to be our enemy has been turned into our liberator. Amen. It'll free us Amen. from the things that hinder us, Amen. but only in Christ. Amen. Now I was going to read a few scriptures, and a marvelous thing has happened here today. I actually was a little bit nervous, and so I, I didn't do as I had planned, but I am going to read these very few scriptures. In John 14, verse 9, um, I, was, I was going to preface this by saying that uh, 
In times past, I had a limited view of God. And so I had a very limited effect in my life. As my view of God became more complete, the effect of the gospel grew. And then in John 14, 9, this is Jesus talking to Philip. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Amen. The glory of the new covenant in Christ, in Christ, he shows us the Father. We don't hear about him. He shows us the Father. It says in John 1, 18, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. And he is the express image of God, the brightness of his glory. So that it is an exact image. It isn't in a glass darkly. When we see Christ, now if you see Christ, it's not. If you don't see Christ, then your image is still foggy. But as much of Christ as you see, that's how much of God you see. Amen. In um, John 10, verse 30, this is a bold statement. I and my Father are one. Mm -hmm. Well, now, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Mm -hmm. This is the will of God that we should be grafted into the Godhead. Amen. And then um, I'm just going to read part of John 5, verse 18. God was his father. The, uh, well, it says the Jews, whenever Jesus was, was talking to the Jews, he says, sought the more to kill him. Because not only had he broken the Sabbath, but he said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Yeah. Long time I didn't understand why they got so upset with him until I realized the significance of saying God is my father. Mm -hmm. When I understood that, then I rejoiced to say God is my father. Amen. And then the last, just a couple last ones here, brethren, and I won't, I won't be long here. Romans 8, 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? This is not a covetous statement. Mm -hmm. we're, we're not asking for things of the earth because God has given us Christ. In fact, if you have Christ, if you really have received Christ, the things that some people think of when they read that verse won't pop into your mind. Amen. A new Cadillac will not be one of the things that you think of. You're going to be thinking about uh, whenever scriptures talk about if we're joint heirs with Christ and heirs of God. That's the inheritance you're going to be thinking of. That we have, we have actually inherited God in Christ. Amen. And then Romans 8, 17. That's the one that I just referred to. And if children, then heirs heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Now the earth isn't going to like this. Just like those Pharisees that got upset with Jesus because he said that God was his father. There are going to be folk that get real upset with us when we say God is our father. But they haven't seen the glory of the new covenant. Because they haven't entered into it. The glory of the new covenant will cause you to come into all the things that God purposed before the foundation of the earth. He wanted us. He wanted us. And Jesus was, was that effective minister of God's purpose and will in the earth. And whenever, when we see it and believe it, then we enter into it. Amen. Now it's an evil heart of unbelief that would keep us from it. But all of these things are ours, brethren. The glory is like a manifestation. Whenever somebody is glorified, they're like known for who and what they are. Mm -hmm. Now 
God glorified Christ. He manifested the Christ. And Christ glorified God. He showed us God. There's coming a day whenever he's going to glorify us. He's going to show everybody who we are, who he made us, what he made us. And then we, even now, in a first fruit sense, and then we're going to glorify him. And we're going to say, it is all of God. Amen. And we love him for it. Amen.